This is Fenland Falls near Peterborough. And a few years ago, an aerial photographer saw some interesting crop marks here and took some photos. This is one of them, and these are the marks. They're huge, about 200 metres across from here to here. Archaeologists had a look at the photos and got very excited. They think that they're evidence of a 6,000-year-old structure, which they call a Neolithic causeway enclosure. But agreeing on a name and agreeing they're very important is the easy part. Agreeing what they're for is very different. Is this evidence of a massive farm or some kind of settlement or a ritual site? Very few of these things have ever been dug, so anything we find could help solve the puzzle. And we've got just three days to do it. The plan is to put trench one on the inner ring of the ditches on the east side and a second trench on the west side where the ring of ditches disappears under an area of thick mud left by an ancient river channel. The dark band running down the middle is mud left by a Roman canal. The geophysics team have finished surveying the areas targeted for the two trenches and the results aren't what was expected. You've got the problem, I'm afraid. This is where the in a ditch should run. We've done the geophysics and I can't see it at all. But oh, uh, there is something here, isn't there? I just think that's probably geological. Well, it shows up superbly well on the photograph. I know it does. But look at the other end well, where you can't see it. Well, that's just that black alluvial stuff, stuff isn't it? <laughs> but look at the geophysics. <laughs> it's so clear. Isn't it? I don't understand why we're not seeing it at this end mm. when it's so clear here. Finding the rings of ditches is going to be key to figuring out why Neolithic people built these monuments. What we do know is that after two million years wandering the landscape, our hunter-gatherer ancestors began a more settled existence. This change from a completely nomadic lifestyle marked the beginning of the Neolithic Age, which in Britain lasted from 4000 until 2500 BC, when metals first came into use. Causewayed enclosures were built from the very start of the Neolithic period and must have played an important role in the new way of life. Right, I think we're done at the right level here, Kerry. You can see it's good and clear. Yeah. So you see the change from the orange here to the clay. Yeah, it's very clear from up here. Is it? Yeah. I think that's your buried Neolithic soil. Right. Francis's trench on the east side and Phil's on the west side are both placed where we think the inner ring of the ditches is. If we look at these trenches in the context of the entire field, we can get our first real sense of how big the monument is. But it's not the only one discovered in this area. So this is our causeway enclosure here, and there's another one here, and one here, and one here, and yet another one here. Yet these are very rare Neolithic <laughs> phenomenon, and we've got five together. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I think it was deliberate. I think these are marking the edge, the boundary, of a really important cultural territory. Cultural, Stuart? Well, it could be cultural, it could be practical as well, because if you, if you look at this grouping, and they are very close together, they seem to relate to the Valley of the Welland. And if you look at this geological map, over here, all these pretty colours are upland. All this blank yellow out here is, is Fenland, it's bog, it's unpleasant. But all these enclosures occur where the Welland meets the bog, effectively. They're on this zone in between. So I think we've got to look at reasons why they all cluster together. So are you going to try and tie them all up for us? Well, I'd like to. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big task. I'm going to go and look at these locations for the causeway enclosures we know about and see how they relate to the geography, how they relate to each other, see if we can somehow get back to the landscape of the Neolithic. Knowing when you found a ditch can be a bit tricky, as they are, after all, simply holes dug in the ground 6,000 years ago. It's quite ephemeral, though, the archaeology, isn't it, Phil? What do you mean, pretty vague? <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, yeah, it is. It, it is. It is. Uh, it's very, very difficult to see. I suppose identifying it is just a result of, of observation and experience, really, isn't it? Subtle changes in the colour of the soil might be the only thing to indicate that you've come across one. And after a little more digging, that's exactly what Phil thinks he's got in Trench 2, along with some of the River Welland. What have you got here, Phil? <laughs> we got the ditch. <laughs> you don't have, look, haven't you? Don't look in that section no. because it's, it's actually sloping up. 
But on this side, damn it, you can see it, it's actually coming down there. And then it dips down here. It's very difficult to see it there. But once you get along here, you can actually see the edge very clearly against this white gravel. And then it rises up the other side. To make a ditch at Northborough, Neolithic people dug down through dark clay soil into the lighter gravelly soil underneath. We know from excavations at other causeway enclosures that they placed important objects into the ditches. Then soil from the banks was put back over them. This is what we call the backfill. When the ditch was no longer needed, the remainder of the bank would be placed back on top of it. Is there any way that we could date this tiny piece of pottery? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a very classic piece of uh, beaker pottery. Beaker as in the beaker people? As it, yeah, as in beaker, early Bronze Age, so it's around about 2500 BC. And would this actually have been a beaker? Yeah, it's a very sort of finely made, very finely decorated drinking vessel. You sometimes get them associated with burials, but they are quite a common feature, uh, finding them as individual fragments in the top of Neolithic ditches. Only another thousand years to go and we're in the Neolithic? A thousand years straight down. The beaker style of pottery was brought here by migrants from mainland Europe. Although we can't be sure why they turn up on the top of Neolithic ditches, it could be because the monument was regarded as a special place even in the Bronze Age. The world of the ancestors obviously doesn't exist, but in their minds it did, and the ancestors were in league with something bigger and something more powerful. So by linking yourself to heroic figures in the past, you were linking yourself into God. A great deal's claimed for Neolithic causeway enclosures. According to Francis, they're monuments built in reverence to gods and ancestors. According to Ben, they're more likely to be the first farms or villages. But which is it? Or is it neither? We've found the inner ring of ditches in both our trenches, but what we haven't found is anything to help us answer these fundamental questions. Neolithic ditches are the treasure chests of their age. But we do know there are Neolithic people here because clever old Matt has found, let's have a look, about 10 minutes ago, that. Do you know what that is? Is that an arrowhead? Yeah, it is. It's a very distinctive leaf-shaped arrowhead. It's snapped across the middle. That's why it's got a flat end. And they're most commonly found in causeway enclosures. It's a beautiful find, isn't it's it? It's absolutely cracking. It's so thin and beautifully made, that lovely ripple flaking on it. A lovely thing. So at the very start of day two, we've got our first Neolithic find. Leaf-shaped arrowheads were made from the very early Neolithic period at around 4000 BC. This one was either broken while being made or during hunting. It was found outside a ditch in Trench 2 and was most likely just thrown away. The all-important placed objects will be inside the ditches. And now that we've found them, Francis helps Matt mark out an area to dig. We're digging the inside. That's right, yeah. So anything from the interior will be in this side of the ditch. I think it's going to be the best bit to dig. If these monuments were part of a transition to a more settled lifestyle, we'd expect to find evidence of a Neolithic village here. In Phil's trench, Matt has been digging down through the layers of a ditch. There's not a lot of finds so far, but one of them takes us back to the very beginnings of pottery. Well, it's not exactly the crown jewels, is it? Uh, well, no, I think it is for, for the Neolithic. Um, it's quite nice. We've, we've got uh, fragments of uh, pottery come out. We've got this little sort of rim uh, with these decoration on it. Uh, and and is that definitely Neolithic? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. That looks, looks like it's a piece of uh, Mildenhall ware. This is the first sort of pottery vessel that we see in the British Isles. It's quite coarse, and to our eyes, it's, it's very basic, but this is state-of-the-art uh, domestic product for the Neolithic. And all these bits? Um, we've got nice bits of firecrack flint, all that sort of crazy lines on it suggest it's been in the middle of a hearth, in the middle of a very intense fire. Where did all this come from? Well, we think we've got the end of the ditch here, so we concentrate on that, and it's all coming from uh, the top layer of it there, where, where all the charcoal and burnt door was. Um, if we get down in deeper, hopefully we might find some more, more meaty stuff. Mildenhall ware was made from about 3,600 BC. They were round-bottomed pots, decorated with simple lines and dots on the rim and sides. This find gives us the first firm evidence the causeway enclosure at Northborough was in use from the very beginnings of the Neolithic age. I think we've got uh, what looks like the remains of a pot with some sort of um, burnt material in it. Ooh. Yeah, it's like sort of 
wet digested biscuit. Yeah, it's gone back to mud. It can't go back to being mud unless it's very, very poorly fired. Right. Very poorly fired. But it, is it actually on the bottom of the ditch? That's the bottom there. It was really yeah. hard. Yeah. So it's yeah. nearly there. Oh, yes, it's pretty well on the bottom, yeah. That's interesting. You've got a pot on the bottom of the ditch near the centre. It's got charred grain in it. It doesn't look much now, but I reckon we're looking there at a deliberately placed offering. This is a forearm bone. It goes right there. Oh, right. And um, this, looking at it, has been split while the animal has just been newly killed. It's hit it with a rock or something right at that point and split this side wall of the bone off right. to expose all the marrow inside. And they used to eat a lot of marrow in those days, so you find a lot of bones like this. Is it being cooked? I would think not before it's had the side knocked off to get the marrow out, because that would cause the marrow to dissolve. So I think this has been done just after the animal's been skinned and butchered. Francis's trench is providing our first clues about what Neolithic people did here. The offering pot at the bottom of a ditch is evidence for Francis's ritual activity. But the cattle bones suggest there was domesticated cattle kept here, which supports Ben's view that this was a farm. As yet, there's not enough evidence to prove either theory. Stuart has now combined his knowledge of the Neolithic enclosures he visited with what we know about the one at Northborough. This is the best understanding we have of the monument in its landscape at the time. So it really is quite a lonely situation surrounded by water channels with only a few dry land approaches to it at most but times of the year. Very evening. much so, yeah. I mean, one of the objectives we set out from here was to try and look at this monument against the background of all these other causeway enclosures here, the five in, in this grouping, which seemed quite unusual. If you look at these other enclosures, can you see up at Barham, its visibility is restricted in that direction. Can't see anything in that direction at all, but you can actually see in a cone down to the river. At Uffington, it's exactly the same. See how it collects the river, as it were, in that direction, but there's no visibility that way. So really, they're all looking down onto sort of waterways, and Etna and Northborough are also in very watery situations, as we've just seen from Henry's reconstruction. Exactly. But do you think they're all contemporaries, do you? Um, my guess is that they are. I mean, one thing that makes me think that is the commonality of shape. They've all got this very strong oval shape. Mm. And what makes it particularly interesting that Northborough's actually got more rings than the others. And that's the furthest east along the Welland. And it just makes me wonder if that's kind of as far as they were reaching out and this one had specific monumentality that they wanted to implant on the landscape. Phil's perseverance has been rewarded with an important last-minute find. Well, what have you got? Wow, what have I got? Gordon Bennett, where did this come from? Oh, it's just down in the bottom of the ditch there. This is the best bone we've had yet. Do you is know what it? this is? Well, no, I wouldn't ask you if I did. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> this is an aurochs. What? Wild cattle. It's the only one we've seen so far. This is incredible. This is a distal fit. It goes right there in me, and it's about four times as big. This has never been domesticated. This is a wild animal through and through. How frequently do they turn up on causewood enclosures? Uh, not very often, let's put it that way. It's a nice thing to find. It's very special. Well, you see, it, it, you, you know, you're kind of saying how important it is. The place where we found it is special. Why because is it's right at the bottom of the ditch. It's right in the middle between the two ends. That's this right. did not happen by accident. This it has been put seem... here quite deliberately. It does seem just too much it's of a... It's too much of a coincidence. That is a Too much, much of a coincidence. I'd better go and find some more. Made my day. <laughs> <laughs> Aurochs were hunted in the Neolithic period, but must have been quite a challenge to kill. They were formidable beasts, built like a Spanish fighting bull, but twice the size. At the start of our dig of the Causeway enclosure at Northborough, we had two opposing views about what Neolithic people did here. Francis argued it was a place for rituals revering the ancestors and gods, while Ben thought it was where Britain's first farmers gathered in their resources. So after all this archaeology, are you still convinced that essentially this is a big farm? Well, look, we've got enhanced magnetism in the ditches here. This is burning. This is uh, debris and, and charcoal from settlement being dumped into the top of ditches. On the interior of the enclosure, again, the anomaly is raised by the burning here, so it comes out as, as yellow. The phosphates, too, show that we've got animals being driven into the enclosure. 
pulled outside and then driven in. So, you know, I think it's pretty compelling. <laughs> compelling? Um, superficially, yes, but the burning on the interior would fit beautifully with people using this seasonally, clearing off the, the, the vegetation and then getting on with their religious you know, activities. It does stretch credibility somewhat, doesn't it, to think that this huge earth monument with these massive ditches around it was built simply to be a farm. Well, not a farm, but a place where resources are pulled into. They dominated a wide area of this landscape. They are farming it and they're bringing the resources back here. I, I just don't think you let your cows into church, do you? And you don't <laughs> let them poo in church when they're there. That's a point, isn't it? Aren't you simply importing a theory which works well in other sites where they have found ritual deposits and sticking it here where they haven't found any? <laughs> well, I'd contest the, the fact they haven't found any. We've got that half-fired pot, which doesn't make any sense, uh, full of charred grain right in the bottom of the ditch, and that aurochs bone, which is placed absolutely on the bottom of the ditch, right in the middle. And that thing is a deliberate placement so are you prepared to concede that there might be a ritual element here? Well, look, I think in everyday life there's an element of ritual that, that creeps in and I think we can pick that up through archaeology. So I'm prepared to concede that they were doing things that were not wholly practical all of the time. <laughs> and are you prepared to concede <laughs> that there was probably some farming going on here? <laughs> of course. And I, I think what really worries me, Tony, yeah. I think if we continue this discussion for another two or three minutes, we might end up agreeing so I think we should no, stop. Let's stop now. <laughs> cut, cut. <laughs> the Causewayed enclosure at Northborough was the grandest of the group in the area. It was situated on an island surrounded by lush fenland and river channels and seems to have been built in two phases. The inner ring of ditches was built first at the very start of the Neolithic age, while the smaller ditches of the outer rings were added later. The light gravelly soils of the banks would have stood out against the landscape and could have been seen from a great distance. The effect of the whole monument would have been very dramatic. No other great monuments came before it. No other man-made structures competed with it. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses, and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. One hot day in 1922, a young man called John Poole strolled across this Sussex Down. He was the victim of a First World War gas attack and he came here looking for fresh air and a bit of peace. But what he found may be one of the very few Stone Age settlements ever discovered in England. But he wasn't an archaeologist, he was a 23-year-old gramophone salesman, which made him highly unpopular with the archaeological elite. Now, 80 years after he first set foot on this hill, Time Team have come here to reassess his work. Number one, Francis. Number one. Number one. Number one. Lucky old me. So our first target is what appears to be a ring barrow. Perhaps the same one excavated by John Poole in the 1920s. Phil's opening a second trench over a feature that looks like it could be another ring barrow. And Bridge is investigating an area of disturbance that we hope marks the spot of the Neolithic houses. Look, no, look, can't concentrate. There you go, there's a ditch. This is the ditch. Do you reckon this is a ditch that Paul found? Yeah, without any doubt. Because look at the stuff in the section here. It's very, 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 very loose. There's no way that's been there since the Neolithic. That proves absolutely that this was a, a pool ditch. And this is this thing on the GFS? It's about 15 metres diameter. What do you think it is? Well, I'm sure it's the outer ditch of a barrow. So what's 15 metres? Uh, well, run round and we'll see. All right. Yeah, away a bit, Tony. So this is a ditch round a burial mound? Yes, well, except there wasn't a mound. What do you mean? Well, it was a flat barrow. They do occur, it's not unusual. Barrows are mounds or ditches built over or round a burial. They're often in prominent positions, which suggests they acted as a kind of marker or focal point. 
and Francis now thinks that John Paul didn't excavate all of the ditch, which means there could be untouched prehistoric material waiting to be discovered. Which is just as well, because our long trench looks a lot less promising. In fact, the longer it gets, the emptier it looks. Our only hope of finding the dwellings now is to go back to John Poole's sketch map and compare it with aerial photographs taken before the site was bulldozed. But, but, but we've used that one to calculate that one. Yeah, but that's because it's from this, isn't it? it sounds simple. Yeah. They're a good 20 metres apart. Aren't but it isn't. Wow, well, those were 200 metres apart. If we can get our sums right, then there's still a good chance we could find the houses tomorrow. It's been a frustrating first day. But our number one Flint fan has loved every minute. What do you think of that then? That is really good, and it? That is our one find. I know you're going to tell me that that's a scraper or something, but how can I tell that that's anything more than another old pebble? Look, you see that, that swelling? That's what we call the bulb of percussion, and that is really the, the indicator that this has actually been struck off and it is not just a stone out of the ground. It's an early Neolithic scraper. Well, fair dues, it's a great little find, but it's the only find we've got. Y yes, but, but, you know, this is one of the most fundamental periods in our island story. It's that, that point where people stopped roaming around on the landscape and they actually started to settle down. They started making vast communal monuments, enormous burial mounds, and they started making settlements. But finding them's proving tricky. Geophys couldn't do it, but if Henry's got his sums right, he should be able to plot their coordinates onto the ground. So, Henry, you reckon you've finally calculated the position of Paul's excavations? Yeah, well, this is going to be D2. D3's going to be over that way a bit. Sort oh, of. come on. <laughs> come on. How have you arrived at these precise positions from this? The only feature we, we know is B9. That's now. the one that Francis is digging. That's right. So, uh, everything's measured from there. But this isn't to scale. There's another map which has some of these features on, which has a scale on it. It's a long shot. <laughs> Why don't you give me that? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Walk off out there and select a spot. <laughs> Despite Phil's scepticism, we're opening two trenches over what we hope are Neolithic houses. It's our last throw of the dice. If we can't find them this way, we never will. Luckily, there's good news from Myrtle Grove Farm. Geophys think they've spotted something that could be evidence of a prehistoric house. So we're putting in yet another trench. That's coming onto it there, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Seems quite a distinct change. That looks nice, so we just keep go back. So you're watching other people working? Well, I'm entitled every now and again to rest my weary bones. Besides, this is experimental archaeology. In what way? Well, I'm just having a nice cup of Jackie's Neolithic tea. So how do you make it, Jackie? Well, what we've done is we've put some elderflowers in the water and we've put some honey in. We had a hot stone yeah. and I just sizzled it slightly in some water. <laughs> That's it. You going to try some? Oh, yeah. Let's <laughs> have yeah. See? Oh, nice, isn't it? Mm. The little flowers go... <laughs> <laughs> They're nutritious. <laughs> so what else are you going to be doing? Well, we're going to be doing some experiments to see actually how people might have lived in this landscape, and we thought uh, we might make uh, Phil a new hat. <laughs> Save yourself the trouble. I don't want a new hat. There's plenty of life left in this one, yeah? Phil, that is the most disgusting, stained piece of headwear in the whole of British archaeology. While Phil looking. tries to hang on to his hat... Over in that corner, yeah. ...we're busy expanding our trenches on both farms. Yeah. So it is, it's curving through here. Yeah. We now know that John Poole didn't have the time or the technology to completely excavate this site. So we're picking up the story yes, where he left off. It's a bit of a circle that you got in the chalk there, isn't it? Well... On Long Furlong Farm, we found what he thought was a Neolithic dwelling. But Phil's got another theory. I don't know. I don't think it's a dwelling. I mean, what do you think about this, Sally? Well, I'm not convinced that it is a dwelling, but it did have a certain amount of domestic refuse in here. Paul found work flint, 
cracked flint, fire cracked flint, so it had been in heat, bits of sandstone rubbers from grinding corn, animal bones and pottery here. What's your problem with it being a hut if there is all this domestic stuff? My, my problem is that chalk can play funny tricks on you because mm. chalk's a very soft rock and because it's, it's soft, it will actually decompose when you get water on it, particularly if you've got root system with a tree. And what you're left with is the brown clay that is actually in the chalk. So what you can be looking at with a feature about this size is where a tree has been standing in the chalk and it tips over. Hold on a minute. What about all the domestic rubbish? It, it, it is still possible that, that, that you can get material that is building up in these tree throws. It's still possible that people can actually be taking shelter in the tree Ooh. throws. I just do not believe that this is, that this is a, a dwelling. And it's the same story in Bridges Trench, just the outline of another uprooted tree. These are natural features, not Neolithic houses. John Poole misinterpreted them. Move on over, yeah. Our search for the pit village is over, so instead we focus all our energy on the ring barrow... Just down in that corner. ..in the desperate hope that we can make sense of what John Poole might have missed. Whoa, 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 whoa. And we've got our first find. Yeah, about this, then? But it's not exactly prehistoric. We've got evidence of Poole being here, look. F-R-Y Pryco. Oh. oh, but that's some good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and pretty soon, we've got our first find from inside the ditch. This is the first bit of pot we got, actually, so it's quite important I mean, we want that to we actually, date it. it. It could well be a bronze age. It's the right sort of thickness. This is really sharp edge, so yeah. it suggests that it is in situ yeah. and it hasn't been battered around on the surface before it's gone in but it's one of just a handful of finds. We know prehistoric people were here, so we'd expect to see a lot more finds than this. So where are they? Phil and Maisie think they might have the answer. Why have you brought us here, Phil? We must be 200 metres from the rest of the dig. Yeah, but... You know, we haven't got many finds in the plough soil up there. Yeah. Well, we wonder whether they're all down here. You see, when I was a student um, 30 years ago and um, training digs down here, they were just beginning to realise that the reason there was nothing on top of the hills was it was all washed down into the valleys. Why would it come so far? Well, gravity, partly, but, um, I mean, th th there's nothing else to stop it. And you're talking about thousands of years. Well, that's about the bottom, isn't it? Yep. I'm not actually sure what we're looking for. Well, we're looking for anything that may have derived from up there. This would be the obvious thing pot and it, it will have been undisturbed down there. But at the same time you've got to remember that prehistoric pottery was very, very lowly fired. In other yeah. words, it's, it's just basically like, well, as you know, dog biscuit. Mm. Yeah. And so when it gets in the moisture, if it, if it gets a lot of dampness in it, it will just fall to bits. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah. actually quite rare. If we, yeah. if we found Neolithic pottery in here, that would be seriously rare. But flints, Flint, there's no good yeah. reason why we no, shouldn't no find flints. Yeah. Oh, that's got a bit of an edge on it, hasn't it? There we go. Yes, I'll, gi I'll give you that one. Brook flint. That is very sharp. It's it's in beautiful condition. Yes! Oh, prehistoric oh, pot. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> you can have the big bit. <laughs> we were just about to finish the scene. The director had just said, all right, everybody, Let's go back up the hill. And here it is. Fantastic. Oh, it's wobbling. Yeah, it's wobbling. That's a good sign. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's going to come. Right, well, what it's is a it? a nice big piece. Ooh, and it is decorated. Yeah, and it is a collared urn. Oh, that's fantastic. So it would have been upright like that. So what sort of date do you reckon that is? Well, it's early Bronze Age, about 1800, 1900, 1900. BC, I should think. Yeah. That is fantastic. This, this could be a cremation. And then on top of it, of course, we had this. And this is, when I was watching the digger, the, this was sticking up above the chalk. Mm. It's obviously a marker for this little It must pit. be. And these don't normally occur on their own, so I wouldn't be at all surprised no. if there weren't more underneath there. But uh, Gosh, I think that's fantastic. Is this a cremation or something else? We're extending the trench in the hope of finding other pits and making sense of this intriguing barrow. 
and almost immediately we uncover another flint marker. Back on Myrtle Grove Farm, it looks as though we could be onto something. You know your dad was supposed to have found this mysterious second settlement, but yeah. there's no records around of it at all. We put this trench in here to see if we could find any evidence of it. Miles, have you come up with anything yet? That looks uh, like a cup to me. Certainly, yeah, you can yeah. see the, uh, the solid natural chalk uh, coming up here. I mean, it just takes a dive, mm. and then where Ian is digging, we, it comes up again. What we've got is a, is a cut into the side of the hill, almost like a, a terrace. And that's what, exactly what you'd expect on a slope like this. If you were building a house, you terrace into the side of the hill. So, theoretically, this should be uh, an area of uh, prehistoric housing. What's so frustrating is that so many of the finds and so many of the notes associated with this area have gone missing. It's essentially, the flint mine site, all the finds, the archive and everything is in the museum. But all the sites around the periphery where other people were involved, uh, a lot of the material is still missing. I think it was scattered amongst a whole range of different sources. I right, want to get cracking on with this ditch. Meanwhile, back at our ring barrow, Phil's investigating a series of small pits outside the ditch. You think it's strange? Inside them, we found pieces of pot, stone and worked flint. Each pit was topped with a large lump of flint. Evidence that could suggest these are cremations. But Phil's not so sure. One thing I don't think it is, is there's no cremated bones, so these are, I don't, I'm sure are not... Not, not, not straight cremations. Not, no. Well, I don't think they're cremations at all. At all. No. We've been discussing what they are. It's funny in a way what they've got in them. You see, virtually you've got no finds at all, but in this one you've got this strange stone. Now, I just wonder, is this sarsen? Looks it, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm you sure know, it's... the local sandstone. But I've not seen any sarsen on this site at all. Have you? No. But when we've got it on this site, it's in the top of a feature. Oh, yeah. And then when you go to this one, we've got, again, virtually no finds, but one tool, one yeah. little scraper. Nice little scraper. Lovely yeah. little scraper. In that one, again, Hardly any finds, but in that case, you've got a big piece of pot. Yeah. I don't know, there just does seem to be some that is... Well, I reckon that these pits, filled with special things, commemorate somebody's life. And that's one of the reasons why they don't cut one another. They're all carefully spaced out, just like graves in a churchyard. These big lumps of flint here, that's marking the spot. And I think the fact that they're just outside the, the barrow, I think that's very interesting, that they're put there to be close to something that was important a little bit earlier. One thing I think we can rule out is that they are not settlement. They are not somebody living here. No. Absolutely. But if it's not a mine, what is it? I mean, that's weird, isn't it? Uh, it, it is, it is. It's, it's curious to think what this might be. I mean, it's really this whole central space within the ditch. I and mean, the only other feature within the interior is this very sort of irregular tree flow hole. But no burials? No burials. I mean, over there, in the flint mines, they're digging holes and they're getting flint out. And here, they're digging holes and they're putting flint back. It's, it's almost as if it was some form of a, of, a, of a burial, of a ritual, of, a, you know, of offerings. And then you get the ditch goes around the outside and it sort of bounds this sacred area. And then you get those, those commemorative pits. Indeed. I, I think it's fantastic. It Can is. you think of another one? No, it is unique. So this barrow wasn't built to honour the dead, but to honour the two things that dominated prehistoric life here on Black Patch Hill. Flint and trees. It was flint that brought people to Black Patch, and flint that helped them to clear the trees and shape the world around them. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. Welcome to Dartmoor, one of the richest and best mapped prehistoric landscapes in Britain. But not all of it has been investigated and there's a very good reason for that. Because for the last 150 years, this has been at the bottom of the reservoirs that supply the people of Torquay with their drinking water. Fast forward to the present day and the reservoirs looking pretty empty because the local water company have decided to pull the plug and give us a unique opportunity to explore a lost world. 
This could be some of the best prehistoric archaeology in Britain. The only problem is, now we've got rid of the water, how are we going to cope with the mud? It really is very difficult. There could be a complete prehistoric site waiting to be discovered beneath all this mud. But the prehistoric is a fantastically long period of time and covers everything before the Roman conquest of Britain nearly 2,000 years ago. Your perfect site. Oh, it's a, it's a dream, Tony. You could actually walk across it and stub your toe on the prehistory. You know, I'm used to having to dig down to get it, but yeah. here it's at the <laughs> surface. Why are you here, though? Well, Dartmoor's been an interest of mine for about 40 years now, and it's because of that. It's because, you know, Unlike almost anywhere else, you can walk through a Bronze Age landscape. But it's mainly because I've got to look after him, of course, you know. <laughs> I've got to keep an eye on him. As well as the mysterious mound in the middle, what we've been told we've got from the initial survey is a stone circle, two rows of stones in a line, which could be some kind of walkway, a single row of stones, and some other prehistoric stuff dotted throughout the site. Piles of rocks that might be cairns where people buried their dead. If we can prove all of this, it'll be an archaeologist's dream. We can't wait for GFIs to sort themselves out. We've got to get on with the dig. So we're starting at the end of the single aligned row of stones. Phil's put in the first trench over this pile of stones, which we're calling the terminal cairn. Cairns are rock-covered burial mounds, so we're looking for any evidence of burial to try and get an idea of what the site was used for while Matt is opening up Trench 2 on the two cairns immediately south of the big mound. You can see the large one right there, oh, yeah. and there's a yeah. little one just in front of us here. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> for the moment, we're just cleaning up all this silt, just so we can get the full extent of them all, and then it's going to be a case of half-sectioning them. We're going to go run a string across from there to there, and we're going to, uh, after we've planned and photographed it, we're going to start carefully taking out this side of each cairn. Underneath, there could be a burial, there could be ritual offerings. I mean, that's yeah. another thing we're really looking forward to. Some important clues could be on the mound. Flint was found here during the initial survey, and today it's attracted our flint-obsessed anoraks like moths to a flame. The only trouble is it could completely rewrite the history of this Bronze Age site, as Phil's found something that dates much earlier. It's this gorgeous little end scraper. You can see the way it's been retouched so lovingly all the way around there. Now, that is the work of a skilled craftsman. Somebody who really loved his work. Can you put a date on it? They are difficult to, to date in isolation. We really could do with some more of this flint work. But my initial instinct is to think this is early. And when I say early, I think it's earlier than these stone monuments. That's really exciting, isn't it? Because that means you've got this early mound here with some sort of activity going on, and then later people have built this path up to it. Absolutely. I think that this mound is the focus. This is what drew people in originally, and then that these stone monuments were drawn in around them. Look at you clutching your straight... I know! It's lovely, though, isn't it? You're like you... a kid in a sweet I shop, know, I you? know, I know. But, you see, I've made so many of these things. This takes me back to the real people who, who made these things. <laughs> if we're right, and it is this vast prehistoric ceremonial landscape, mm. what does it mean? What's it for? Well, what it was for was the different things in people's lives that they want made formal and ceremonial. So these cairns would be when someone passes on to the next world. Um, this double stone row could be a procession um, that marked when a new uh, chief came to, to power, something like that. Um, this stone circle was where people celebrated the changing of the seasons. So it's like a combination of a church and a registry office? And a town hall. Yes, it, it's all there. Um, and the thing is, it all seems to fit together, Tony. It's almost too good to be true, isn't it? It is. And then of course, all these theories rely on the dates of these monuments tying together. Mind. Well, I mean, I think it looks like these stones here from this cairn are later than these ones here. Over in Trench 1, we've got major doubts about the terminal cairn being prehistoric, especially when you compare it with the single stone row. Is the cairn earlier or later than the stone row? And we should get it in that section? Absolutely. All right, fair enough. 
And it's not looking any better in Trench 2 either, as we're uncovering evidence that the cairns aren't prehistoric at all. We've removed the silt here. You can see this really fine, almost clay on top there. And that was a silt from the bottom of the reservoir. And it's sitting on top of this dark layer, which was the ground surface in 1860, when the reservoir was filled. Does this mean that all the piles of stones around the reservoir are likely to be from the 1860s? Well, that one's 1860. This one here as well, it's in front of you, that's also clearly sitting on top of that old ground surface. The cairns that we have are coming in a line along the edge of the reservoir. They're all in a nice line. My bet is none of them are prehistoric. I seem to remember not long ago saying that this all seemed too good to be true. Scarily, I was right. Then over here, we've got another stone, the one that matched that. Mm. Oh, yes. I mean, I think we've got the, the hole, haven't we, for the, for the stone? It looks like it. I mean, you can see that small rock standing down there. That's the classic wedging for mm. a stone in a stone row. And the other thing, of course, we've got this stony stuff at the top mm. here. Do you think that could be the remains of a, of a sort of walkway? It's degraded down and it's covering the surface, so right. this must have been at the point at which this was open to walk up and down on, I would have thought. I think that's brilliant. OK, I'm convinced, especially with that little packing stone there, that this is a prehistoric double stone row. Yeah. I mean, little doubt about it. Have you got something going on over there? Back in Trench 1, Phil and Faye may just have found some conclusive evidence that dates the single stone row. There is, you know. There's a cut The good there. news is that, that is it's prehistoric. Cut. That is the hole that has got our long row of stones in. There's a cut in there. You can trace it right from where your trowel is. That's it. Yeah, there. Yep. Now, if you go on up with your trowel, up there, keep going. That's right. It got right the way through that light grey. Yep. So, what the sequence is, they've cut a hole. That's the line you've just scored. Yeah. Then they put the stones in. Then the whole lot is filled in with that dark grey stuff. That's it there. And then the whole thing is sealed off by that very, very dark top, so that old ground surface. This stuff we had earlier on, this stuff all the way along here. That's right. And then the cairn goes on the top of that. That is our sequence. So, basically, we were right. Absolutely. The cairn is later than these. Ah. But it's really nice to see the archaeology prove it, though, isn't it, eh? <laughs> Although the cairn isn't prehistoric, it's helped us to prove that the single stone row almost certainly is. Well, we haven't got a lot of flint coming up or anything, have we? We've established we've got this double stone row going up to the mound, you know, our, our main axis for the site. But why isn't this stone circle on that axis? That's where you'd expect it. It's off to one side, as if they were... I don't know, drunk when they laid it out. So it could still be a stone circle? Just because that turns out to be an ancient stone doesn't mean it's part of a circle. Yeah. So what I'd like to see now would be the results of a geophysics and see if we get a better pattern. So a lot's riding on geophys to prove that the stones are in a circle. Thousands of years ago, the landscape looked very different to what it does today. This 3D model shows the landscape setting really well, doesn't it? It's, you know, the, the if we're going to understand what was going on here, we need to establish what the place looked like in prehistoric times. So Henry's been making a 3D model. Looking at the relationship of the stream as it comes around here, it's so close to the stone circle mm. that if the stream had moved, as they do, um, through time, it would have taken out part of the stone yeah, circle. So what I wonder, sticking my neck out, is whether here we've got another island like this one, mm. but m more subtle mm. because the actual the sedimentation of the of the lake has actually masked it. So after doing this bit, I want to start calling around this area and seeing whether there are other channels and other areas of possible wet deposits which might have made this into another island. Hey, just get on with it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> what else is yes. the same? <laughs> so Henry starts his core sampling to test his theory that the site was built on islands surrounded by water. It's, it's inorganic sediment, if you know what I mean, but it's, mm. it's got enough remains to make it brown. And over in Trench 1, Faye's found some evidence that supports this theory of water being an important feature in this prehistoric landscape. Right. Yeah. So I've got down here the cut for this linear stone, whatever yeah. that may be, yeah. and on that side over there, we've actually got what appears in section is the bank of what I think, because of this sediment down here, a river. 
So we're right on the edge of the valley, in fact. Yeah. When you say a river, you mean one of the streams is coming through here at some stage. Yeah, exactly. And really interestingly, then we've got all these stones which seem to lay in it. Yeah. So they, they're contemporary with this river. With the single stone row deemed prehistoric, another piece of the Bronze Age ceremonial landscape falls into place. We've got the stones that were put in there deliberately to wedge it, to get it at precisely the right angle. So you wouldn't do that if you were just making a field boundary wall or something. So this has to be a Bronze Age stone. Now, whether it's part of a row or a circle, I don't know. I've seen some flints from around this stone. Those flints are definitely prehistoric. I am also convinced that that stone is prehistoric. But, of course, just because we've got one prehistoric stone doesn't mean we've got a prehistoric stone circle, does it? It just means we've got one prehistoric stone. Exactly, Tony. But, look, over there, you see that stone there standing on its own? Yeah. Well, Geophys discovered a stone hole next door to it. So if we put a trench between those two and they're both real and they're both prehistoric, then I think we've got ourselves a stone circle. If Francis is right, then this is a very special site. Because we haven't dug a prehistoric circle on Time Team before. <laughs> as well as Trench 5, we're opening up a further two more trenches on the stone circle. Faye's digging in Trench 6, while Matt is working in Trench 7 on a very large fallen stone. I mean, that's the biggest stone so far, isn't it? It is, yeah. This will certainly be the most I mean, that's prominent. That's already four foot long, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, there we go. That's it, then. Yeah, that's the end. Henry's continuing to core around the mound with help from Bob. They're hoping to prove that the site was made up of sandy islands surrounded by water, which is all part of Francis's idea of a ritual landscape. I've already started coring the other side. We're seeing the, the same materials on the island. I see, I'm calling it an island now, because <laughs> it's starting to look more and more yeah, like We're going to get an idea of what's happening then. Yeah. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is going to be looking that way mm. over to the stone circle over okay. there to see if that's something of an island, same as this one. Yeah. And we're not only looking on the outside of the stone circle, but also in the middle to see what went on here. It's quite weird, though, isn't it? Because you literally come out of this stone circle area, it's very boggy. Yeah. And then as you come onto this area, it's actually quite dry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just like the, the double stone row. You've got the same thing there. Back in Trench 5, the digging frenzy comes to a standstill as Phil is beginning to unearth something. Yeah, you can see there's definitely summit coming round there. And it does have these big stones in it. That don't necessarily look natural. That is another stone hole, Tony. Another prehistoric stone. Another part of the stone circle, absolutely equidistant between that stone there and where Matt is. Come over with me, because we've had some news from Rakshar's trench as well. We're doing sieving here, as you can see. What's that for, Phil? Well, that's to try and get all the flints. Raksha's had quite a lot of flint out of her trench, and we want to make sure that we get every piece of flint. And what you got now, Raksha? We've got a whole heap of flinty goodness in this trench, and I think I think, I don't know whether that's a blade or an arrowhead. No, it's not an arrowhead, I'm afraid. It's a rather nice broken flake, but it's the same material, the mesolithic material that we're getting off the mound. What do you think all this tells us, Francis? Well, it tells us that we've actually got two phases on this site. You've got this earlier Neolithic, Mesolithic, which you've got on the mound, and we've now got down here completely unexpectedly. And then there is a later Bronze Age phase, which goes with the rougher-looking yellow flint, and that is contemporary with the stone circle and the stone row. It's extraordinary how, once again, we're finding so much stuff so late in the dig. And I would remind you that we only have just over half a day left. <sighs> Geophys has had to tackle extraordinary amounts of mud to get the radar results from the stone circle. They've been working around the clock, but they think they've finally cracked it. This is where Phil's been working, and he was talking about finding the stones in that quadrant. Um, look at these results that Jimmy's now presented. One, two, three, and, and a four. fourth. A perfect arc. And when you drop that arc into the bigger picture, it forms that complete stone circle. 
That is the final quadrant, and I don't think it can be clearer than that. I'm convinced, John. I'm absolutely convinced. What we have are two streams from Francis's Bronze Age ceremonial landscape running through the valley either side of the central mound and an island on which the stone circle was built. As yet, we don't know how the stone circle links to the mound, but Raksha may just have found the answer in her trench. Raksha, what's this little depression here that you've been excavating? This depression here, believe it or not, is a post hole we found just after lunch. A post hole? Yep. For something wood? Yes, it's for a wooden post. How do you know that was for a wooden post and not for a stone? Well, if you look in Tracy's trench, she has a standing stone in it and there's actually a cut around it. So it would have gone much deeper. And to pull the packing round, yes, which you don't right. need for a post hole. Uh, any idea of date? Well, funny you should say that, I actually have a bag of flint and I'd love Francis to have a look at them because I would love to know what date they are. <laughs> hmm. We're in the middle of a Bronze Age stone circle. Yeah. We've got a post hole. And these flints are all Mesolithic. So how long before the Bronze Age circle was here would that post have been here? About 4,000 years. Wow. And that's the same sort of date as the mound up there? Yeah. That's extraordinary. So 4,000 years after that post was put in, all these stones were erected. So you were right yesterday afternoon yeah. when you said if we could crack this circle, then we would understand more about the logic of this site. You've got something that's Mesolithic here, yeah. uh, and that's Mesolithic, isn't it, on that mound? Yeah. And then later you've got the walkway coming up to it, yeah. and then you've got the Bronze Age circle. Yes. So this site began when people were still hunter-gatherers, then it became farmers, and then it was an age of metal. Phew, at last. <laughs> that's a relief, isn't it? I know. This is an incredible find. We've uncovered some sort of Mesolithic timber structure as old as the flint work on the mound. So we're now able to link all the features together in our ceremonial site. Now we can see that we've got a complete prehistoric landscape, but every piece of archeology span we've exposed asks the same question. Who were these people and why did they erect it? Is there anything that we can really say about that? Well, I think the answer to that is they were just like us. I mean, this is a very special place. We were in a sort of natural amphitheatre, and all their religious monuments, their constructions, are all intimately related to a very small-scale landscape. I I it's a natural amphitheatre, isn't it? And then within it, you've got these small rises and fall in the landscape, and they relate directly to the actual monuments that were constructed on them, you know, the, the ceremonial monuments. And the ceremonies that were going on here happened over an incredibly long time, three, 4,000 years. So it's all about people's religion developing out of the landscape. And I, I feel a, a strong sense that um, this is a sacred place. Mick, you never get that excited about prehistoric sites, do you? No, no, I'm a pretty cold-blooded character <laughs> about the spirituality and religion and all that. But what convinced me was seeing it from the air, because not only is this site special in this valley, but this valley is in the top of a great massive sort of mountain piece of landscape of Dartmoor, hidden away. You wouldn't be able to see it from below. In fact, you wouldn't have been able to see it until you got really near to it. So it looks to me like a really sort of special place. So I think I'll probably buy into it on this occasion. So yesterday he was Richard Dawkins, today is the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> the entire ceremonial site was made up of a central mound with a timber structure next to it dating from the Mesolithic period 8,000 years ago. Later, about 4,000 years ago, during the Bronze Age, a double stone row was built, acting as a processional way leading up to the mound. Around the same time, the stone circle was built. A single stone row could have acted as an east-west field boundary to the entire site. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.